think about these days All I think about these days Is getting at that goal that's in my heart I need a reason to believe it yeah, Maybe a cure for my disease That song is by Blaine Long My name is Matthew Blades Meet my friends Hi, it's Tim And Beth from the Mulhausen Group Real Estate We are so proud to sponsor another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It You can catch us at tmgphoenix.com That's a good group of people right there Hi, it's Matthew Blades, host of Learn From People Who Lived It And a reminder before we get into today's show That each of these episodes is presented uninterrupted With the support of the Mulhausen Group With the support of ASI or Advanced Systems Integrations They design and install cutting edge audio and visual equipment. So if you're on the IT staff or you're the IT director, please reach out to ASI. This audio visual integrator has offices in Minnesota and in Scottsdale and two decades of experience. And the cool thing about them, they pay real close attention to that last 5%, which is the one that drives you and I crazy. We've got a link to ASI in our show description, or you can go there yourself by visiting asi av Welcome to another episode of Learn From People Who Lived It. My name is Brandy Stahl. I am 44 years old. What story are you here to share? I am here to share a story of the aftermath of an abortion, life support, uh, purpose of living, infertility, the power of a gift, and how to find gratitude and joy in order to pay it forward to others. That's extraordinary. Who do you hope hears this? Anyone that's living life in shame, regret, embarrassment, hate, failure, but also anyone that is willing to acknowledge, accept, forgive, find the courage, hold on to hope, life, and a purpose to find your way back to you, yourself, and to share your story with others. Hi, it's Matthew Blades, and welcome back for part two with Brandy. Part one was about the aftermath of the abortion. In part two, we go down the road of infertility and trying to get pregnant again. Let's pick it right back up where we left off. And I'm going to ask some questions just because I don't know the answers to them. When you uh, go through an abortion and then you're getting ready to have your own children, what are some of the, are, are there old feelings coming up? Um, I do feel like I uh, was holding on to a lot of old feelings. Um, I was monthly, couldn't wait, you know, to be pregnant. And, oh, I knew, you know, again, kind of deep down, I knew I could, it was going to take me a while. But like six months into it, I'm like, oh, okay, like uh, I get pregnant on the birth control pill. I've been off the birth control pill and I'm not getting pregnant. Um, so unfortunately, I hate feeling um being negative and like thinking about that all the time but i just i just had this feeling that it was just not going to go smooth for me whatsoever are you upset you were right um at the time absolutely now it was it was it couldn't have been laid out any better for me explain that I had read up quite a bit about abortion. I, at this point in time, I was 30 after we had tried for about a year. Um, I was trying to do a lot of self-help because I was kind of falling into a depression of like, okay, now it's been a year and now I have to go to this infer- you know, in- dreaded infertility world and pay all this money to have somebody help me get pregnant. Um, ended up... Um, going to a doctor who, uh, you know, I told all my issues. Um, He did do my first laparoscopy surgery to diagnose me with endometriosis at stage four, which is the worst stage that you can be at. So I kind of knew that that was bad, but he was like, okay, we're cleaned out. We're going to get going. Um, Didn't get pregnant. Um, Started doing some IUIs. um, And I did four IUIs with this doctor Um, this doctor was very, he had no empathy or sympathy, um, no bedside manner. Um, just one day walked in very cocky, um, and was like, well, you're going to need to do IVF if you want to get pregnant. Well, you know, at the time that was $10,000 and I, we've already paid for, you know, the IUIs and we're like, okay, you know, like we're young, you know, we've got a decent amount of money at this point in time. Um, so I just, 
I, I was really, I guess, pissed off at him. I was pissed off at myself um, because I'm like, oh my God, I'm paying all this money and I can't even get pregnant with an IUI. And, um, you know, like I knew the next step was going to be IVF and I just, I couldn't believe it. So I beat myself up over and over and over of, wow, here I am. It's science is not even working for me at this point. And I get pregnant on the birth control pill. It was just, it was a very huge eye opener. And that's when I just fell more into, um, a depression. I lost myself. Um, I hated myself. And so the next step, we ended up getting another doctor that I absolutely ended up falling in love with. He was great. Um, he had everything that I needed at the time. And he ended up, it was about a year and a half later, he did another laparoscopy because he was like, I just know that your endometriosis is, is, is terrible. He's like, we're going to do this. We're going to send you three, through premenopause, a shot to stop everything which you want to talk about a crazy bitch during those six months. Holy moly. Uh, so you are your husband. Language. Woo. Um, you, you, you are your husband. You know, I'm sure I, I brought out the worst in him during those six months. Mm. I mean, it was terrible for both of us. But when your body is going through that and hormones are being shot in you and, you know, it was, oh, I'm surprised the poor guy didn't just send me divorce papers at that no, point in time. Come on. Well, you mentioned to me that he had always been very, very supportive in this whole thing. And yes. all the while you're going in what seems like kind of a, a little bit of a, I don't want to use the word spiral because that implies that it's happening fast or whatever. But, you know, you're kind of going, you, you've allowed yourself to enter a headspace that isn't super healthy for you. And knowing what I know about you and uh, your belief system, were you were you wondering were you sitting there beating yourself up thinking like i got this abortion and now i can't get pregnant and god's punishing me and were you having thoughts like that or did that stuff not come into your mind all of the above really i had um i started i found a church i really liked i mean i i say i never really found a church that i loved down down here when i moved but um, I found a really good, good church. I felt great. I started an infertility support group there. Um, but before all that really happened, I would try to go there. And um, I remember one day I was sitting in church trying to just work on myself, you know, and they started talking about abortion. And I just lit up, you know, I felt like it was a red light on me. I lost it. I couldn't bring any more attention to myself if I tried that. Oh, here's me. Here I am. I did this. Um, I had to get up and walk out. Um, I remember having conversations, um, praying to God that, you know, I would become a mom and that everything would work in the way it's supposed to work. But I also remember after I started with this doctor and had the surgery, went through all of this, I ended up um, doing my first in vitro and um, I got pregnant, and I don't know if I told you this before, but I, I did end up being pregnant um, and had a very, very early miscarriage. Um, and I have never been so down in my life because that was the day that I told God to fuck off. And I couldn't believe I went there. But I just couldn't believe that as much as I have been through, that I was being, um, that nothing was working for me. That I just felt this was a lesson that like, hey, you know, you're getting, you're, I'm sorry, but this isn't as easy as what you think. Yeah, it probably felt like punishment. In a lot of ways, it felt like yeah. you were being, it, it felt like you were being punished. And yes. that's a really dangerous place for people, right? And Dr. Frank, I think you need to come in at this stage of the game because what we're talking about is shame and guilt and all of the things that come along with making a decision like she had to. Uh, and, and that's neither one of those spaces are going to be really healthy to live in. We talk a lot about, you know, the difference between things that we can control or should try to control and the things that we can't and we kind of have to accept that we can't control uh, or change certain things we have to kind of figure out how to navigate those once you put that label on yourself of you know i'm being punished uh and if if we go all the way up the the, the corporate ladder if you will to god at the top and say god is punishing me it's like well what control over that do i like I can't, I can't change that. I can't do anything about it. Right. This, this outside force is punishing me. And, and so I'm stuck with it. I have to deal with it. Uh, and, and it, 
it totally sort of undermines any ability to 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 move past it to to feel even a little bit better about it uh because we put all the power out there yeah i was gonna say you sort of given the power away right you need to get the you need to take the power back right you need to you know i refer to it all the time as you, you know, the story owned me for a long time. Now I own the story. Right. Uh, and, and that, that's where you probably had to get. Now you mentioned you get, you get down, you get depressed. Um, and, and I can only imagine knowing what I know about depression, that it becomes a little harder to get pregnant when you're not feeling very good too. Right. Not right. I mean, everything has so much to play in it. My doctor said, he was like, you're not going to have a hard time carrying. You're going to have a hard time getting pregnant. And as a woman through all of this um, infertility world, you feel very ashamed. We don't talk about it. Our bodies are meant to do this. And when that is taken from you, you feel like a failure. And um, when I carried them to 36 weeks, I was so happy. And then I carried them actually 40 and a half weeks. Um, I was in labor for a day and a half. They induced me. I was in labor for a day and a half and I enjoyed every second of it because I knew that this was never going to happen again. I enjoyed it because it took me five years to get there. And every pain that the nurses kept saying, are you, do you feel that? I'm like, that just feels like my endometriosis. I'm like, bring it on. Like this is, and they're just kept saying, man, you're like, you're good. You're legit. He's like, you know, you're carrying twins. And, and I was like, this is the best thing I could have ever dreamed about. And I would love to have had them naturally just because I knew that I wasn't going to go back down that road, but I just wanted those children to be here, um, safe and sound. And I ended up with a C-section and, uh, my first one, which was baby a, he came in weighing 7.3 pounds led, uh, I'm sorry, baby, I won't say his name, but baby B came in at 7.2 and they were both 21 inches long. So that day, my heart, um, as I was actually being stitched up from a C-section, I felt like my heart was actually being stitched back together as well. You told me that you felt like on that day, you, you weren't just given two lives. You were given three. Yep. I felt like I finally had my life back. Brandy, what else needs to be said before we wrap up here? So um, as I was going through my infertility, um, I found out after doing my second um, IVF in vitro that I had to sit down um, across the table, my husband and I, and, you know, we always kind of meet back and kind of talk about like um, why, why it didn't work, what went wrong. Um, and the doctor told me, you know, like your eggs just aren't as viable as what they should be. Um, so with me having endometriosis, so, so bad, um, who knows what happened to my eggs through all the years, but everything was picture perfect when you're going through an IVF and you're, you know, getting size, your, your eggs are being sized and, you know, they pump you full of all this medicine to get them perfect right where they want them before they retrieve them. And they would go in and they re- retrieve 10 to 11 eggs each time. But when they would go in and look at them under the microscope, um, they were black on the inside. Mm. And so they were not maturing as they should have. Um, not all of them were like that, but the ones that should have been the best of the best were. Um, so when you're going through IVF, they take, you know, the husband's sperm and it's called ICSI, where they take the actual sperm, put it into the egg, make an embryo. Um, so I had pretty like maybe five good eggs each time I did it, the the two times I did it, um, they didn't look great. They, they want them to continue to grow and, you know, get to where they need to be by day five. And then that's when they put them back in. Well, by day three, each time they call you for, it's like, it's crazy. It's like, you're getting a phone call from, um, that your child's school, they, they call you every day to tell you how the embryos are doing. Um, so, um, by day three, each time I had done an IVF, um, I only had two left. So either they're going to make it or they're not. So they say, go, let's go ahead and put them in on day three instead of waiting till day five, because day three, hopefully they'll attach and grow. 
So unfortunately, both times that did not work for me. And so we sat across um, the table from the doctor who's explaining all this. And he looked at me and he goes, I think that you're going to need an egg donor if you want to carry your own child. And I immediately was pissed off Um, again at myself more than anybody. Um, I remember my husband probably saw my face and he knew that, okay, like she's going to go postal in a second. And he just (laughs) put his hand on my knee and kind of squeeze, like, just listen to him, you know? And so I listened to what this doctor had to say and I'm like, no way, I'm not going to do an egg donor. And yeah, this isn't for me. I can't do it. And he's like, well, what about your sister? And I'm like, oh, my, you know, my sister has health issues. I would never ask her to put her body through that because it's, it's very rough. IV is very rough on your body and, you know, cousins and all this. So I came to the conclusion when I walked out, um, I was like, okay, I got home that night and I'm like, I, I hate myself even more. And Jason and I were talking and I said, you know, he goes, let me ask you this. And not that I was the problem. I, my husband never would point out that I was the problem ever, okay, which clearly I knew I was. Um, his sperm was fine. But he said to me, he's like, well, if my sperm was an issue, he goes, would you do a sperm donor? And I said, absolutely. That was just right off the bat. I didn't think twice of it. And he just looks at me and he's like, then that might be your answer. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, yeah maybe this is my next step. And so um, it's very hard to ask somebody to donate their eggs to you. (laughs) Yeah. How do you ask that question? Because I've called Frank before and asked him to brunch. And sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what I'm going to (laughs) say. Yeah, that's a little different, a little different, but I, I took my cousin to um, go out to lunch actually and kind of sat down (laughs) and explained the situation um and asked her if she would be willing to do this i was mortified that i would even have to ever do this and she said to me oh my gosh i'm so glad that you didn't ask me to carry a baby for you and i thought oh wow ouch you know what i mean because i thought i would do that in a heartbeat for anyone okay and i was like okay and so we got to thinking she's like oh yes i'll do it i'll do it so she was very gung ho about it and i was like hey listen go home talk to your husband you've got kids i mean Like, I know you're done having kids. Like, you know, this is kind of a serious thing. Like, I don't need an answer right now. Well, fast forward, she got back to me that night and she was all, yes, 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 I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then come to find out the next morning and, you know, Jason and I were on cloud nine, right? I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be, you know, um, a cousin of mine on my mom's side that I felt like she looked like my mom. I felt like, oh, this is going to be great. Like family blood, right? Well, this is kind of when you realize that family uh, blood is, is, is not that thick. It can be very thin as well. Because the next day I got an email, the most excruciating, um, downgrading emails I've ever gotten in my life where she just didn't say no. She said no, very crazy of looking on the internet and Googling everything. Maybe there are wrong reasons to do this and what could go wrong if my child needed a kidney one day. And, and I would go to her and she didn't want to give her kidney. I mean, it was the craziest psychoticness I've ever read in my life. And so she made me feel very belittled. And I saved all those emails one day because I would love to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> but... um So it just really hit me hard. Um, And I was done. I told Jason, I said, I mentally, physically, emotionally, I can't go through this anymore. I'm not going to ask anybody else. I don't know anybody else to ask for their eggs. I'm I'm not doing that ever again. And I was like, let's just move on to adoption. And which I know is a very heartbreaking road as well. Um, But I just, I had to close one door before I opened the next. And I was ready to do that until I got an email from a girlfriend of mine one day when I was working Um, I was in the middle of uh, working. My um, assistant was doing a shampoo for me and I was just kind of hanging out, waiting on my client to get back to my chair. And I get an email and just check in on my phone. And it was October 5th of 2010. Never, never forget it. And my girlfriend that I hang out with quite a bit, I would call her definitely one of my best friends was just kind of like, Hey, I want to touch base with you about your infertility when we go camping into the lake a lot. So she's got children, so we can never really talk about the situation. And she's like, I just want to know where you are in life with this. You know, I think about you all the time, but I also want to tell you about a dream I had. 
And she said, I have had this dream not once, but twice. Her and I are very uh, kind of like the same person when it comes to very intuitional things. She's got weird dreams, weird feelings. Like we just kind of fit together. It's weird. Um, But she said that she had a dream that I needed an egg donor. And um, in this dream that, again, she had once, um, she had twice, that she was my egg donor. And she was like, I don't know if that is what you need. Um, She's like, my kids adore you and your husband. Um, You guys will be fantastic parents. And I would just do anything for you. And I start bawling. Um, I had to go to the bathroom and get my shit together because my client's getting ready to come back out. And, you know, nobody knows what's happening in my world. Hot mess here. And I just text her back and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I can't talk right now. I'll call you tonight. And so we talked, I talked to my husband. She had already talked to her husband. She already knew that she was a place in her life that if this is what we needed, that she would step up in a heartbeat. Um, so we met with a doctor Um, He kind of sat and was like, kind of listening to our story with his mouth kind of wide open, like, what? (laughs) Like, you had a dream. And, and I'm like, yeah, she had a dream. And he's like, you guys are like a power team. You know, all four of us, husbands, girls were were crying, doctors kind of like, what? And, and he's like, let's do this. He was like, this, this is a dream team. And we went through it. And uh, so the way I look at it, instead of adopting a child like what our next step was we adopted her eggs and that's how we got our twin boys do you feel complete i feel complete i'm complete when we first started doing this podcast you and i talked about how the point of it was to bring in people who obviously had a a a story to share but people who are you know, quote unquote, kind of on the other side of whatever struggle that they went through. And you and I kind of admitted to each other and maybe to the audience that like, that still means different things for different people, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't hard days. That doesn't mean that we don't still think about things, you know, being on the other side of things, you know, it looks and and feels different for everybody. Uh, But, but Brandy, yeah, you're, you can, I mean, you can just hear it in your voice, how, uh, you know, the, the, the story kind of came full circle. Um, Mm -hmm. and again, that, that doesn't mean that there may not be those moments. Like we don't, we don't know, but just hearing you today, it's so obvious where you are. Uh, and I feel really lucky that, you know, a lot of people are going to get to hear it, but, but especially lucky that, uh, you know, Matthew and I get, get to kind of hear it, you know, first after all of that and you know me feeling so complete my heart was like stitched back together I was you know and then you know after you have these twins and and I'm like losing my mind at home and you know how hard it was and I had to remind my husband some nights when it was hard and they're both crying and throwing up and you know what I mean just everything and I'm like remember the days that we prayed for what we have now like this might have never ever happened to us we have got to step back and enjoy this and I remember Matthew actually calling uh, one of Nicholas' friends that has twins. And you know who I'm talking about. And I had a breakdown moment. I'm like, oh, my God, how did you do this? I'm dying. I can't handle this. You know, they're, they're slowly <laughs> killing me. They yeah. gang up on me, you know. Yeah. And she had to walk me through it. And, again, I had to be like, wow, Brandy, you're, you're in this place that people dream about being. And you're here. So enjoy it. And I think that that really, when I would think about that, Um, I may not have enjoyed the moments when it was happening, but I embraced them. And I was like, okay, you're going to puke on me again. And you're, you're going to poop on me. Like, okay, I got it. You know, I I got this. Um, (laughs) Doesn't make you want to have kids right now, Frank. Don't you want to like go create kids right now, Frank? Like, no, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you can come visit me. Okay. And I've, you know, well, I'll share Her kids will crap on you. Her kids will crap on you. (laughs) But, you know, honestly, it to end everything and kind of come together. I mean, yeah. I did not forgive myself for still having that abortion until about a year and a half later after I had my kids. And wow. the crazy thing was, is I couldn't even, um, I couldn't even tell my friend, uh, my friend that donated her, her eggs to me. And I felt very selfish, uh, selfish doing that. Because I felt like if she knew my deepest, darkest secret, she wouldn't do this. 
she she would think that what I've gone through, and I thought this many, many a times, that people are going to hear this, people are going to hear my story, and who are the people out here who are going to say, man, you deserve everything that you've been through. You know, you, you took a life at 18, and, uh, you know, this is what happened to you, and I'm glad it happened to you. There might be those people I'm strong enough to understand that um, there are those people out in this world, but I've come to realize that no one's ever going to judge or hate me as much as what I've done that to myself in my lifetime. There's not one person out there. Yeah. And I was sitting in church one day by myself. My kids and husband was not with me that day. And this preacher was talking about how there's a plan for each of us and how it's laid out for you. Um, and sometimes you just have to figure it out. You have to put the puzzle together and I was like, okay, you know, kind of listening. And, and I feel like he's talking to me out of 500 people. And he said that, you know, life sometimes is like when, when you get where you're going, it, sometimes like you have to figure it out. But if you let that opportunity pass, it's gone forever. And I'm sitting here and it was like this light bulb went off on, above my head. And I was like, oh, my God. When it was 16 years at, it was 16 years at that point in time after my abortion, I'm sitting here thinking, Oh my God, I just asked myself after this car accident, what is my purpose? Why am I here? I couldn't figure out why, why God felt like I was not done in my life yet and why I'm still here. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I am, I am supposed to be sharing my journey with people. I am supposed to be, it couldn't be more clear to me that day that God was putting this plan together for me. Like, okay, you made this decision at 18. I saved you two years later. What are you going to do with this? How are you going to pay it forward to others? And that is when I just sat back and felt like, you know what? It, um, two weeks um, after this uh, sermon, um, we were going to be, um, they were going out to the lake nearby for people to either be, um, you know, baptized, rebaptized, whatever. So I decided, you know what, I, I'm going to, I'm going to let this go. Um, I'm done let, with it ruling my life. I had, it had been 16 years since my car wreck, 18 years since this abortion. And I'm like, I'm not letting it rule my life anymore. So I had made the decision that I needed to tell my friend, which was probably the most devastating thing I could have done. Um, at that moment, I called her over the Saturday before I was going to get rebaptized. Um, I told Jason what I was going to do. He kind of felt like, you know, you do what you need to do, but I don't think that she's going to care. And I was like, but I care. I, I, she has to know this part of me. And she came over and I told her and she cried with me. I was bawling. And I was like, I've got to let this go. This has owned me for 18 years. I'm now almost 36. It had been half of my lifetime that I let this own me. And I was like, I can't. And I didn't want Jason to go with me to my baptism. I wanted to do this by myself. And, but my girlfriend said, can I go with you? And I was like, absolutely. So it was the first time in my life. And this was August, 2013, that I stood in front of complete strangers and admitted that I had had an abortion, um, that I had been on life support, that I had went through infertility, that I had an egg donor, that my that life sometimes does not go the way you plan it. Um, but I was sick of this, um, abortion, literally holding my life from me living it. And that day I went down in those waters and was rebaptized and I felt like 500 pounds came off of me and I left it there. I drowned it. And I have never, when I think about it, I think about, um, sadness. It, it brings me sadness, but it also put me where I am today. And I want to share my story because as women, we don't talk about abortions. We don't talk about infertility. And I think there are so many people out there who has walked in my shoes and know that they are not alone, even when you feel like you are. And the day that I drowned that word, um, I can now say the word. I can be in a room and watch a movie with abortion. Um, I've been talking to friends lately and telling them my story. And I just say that word like it's any other word in my vocabulary. And that is the best feeling in the world. We all eventually have to get to that point, don't we, Dr. Frank? Yeah, I mean, you you said it before, right? You, you kind of like, you take that power back. You decide to to leave it behind. I mean, Brandy, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm super happy for you. I'm sure Matthew is super happy for you. Yeah, like we all go through some kind of crap. You've gone through a lot of crap, right? Uh, you know, most people have maybe one story in their life that's kind of a jaw-dropping story. 
Uh, Brandy, you have like five jaw dropping <laughs> stories in your life. It's amazing where you're at right now. I'm happy for you. Well, Thank and I you. just, yeah. And also, isn't it just important to articulate this point that maybe you being here to share this story is enough. Maybe that's enough of a legacy. Maybe that's enough of you for this lifetime to help people feel less alone, to help people understand that they have options, you know? That's, to me, the power of storytelling is that we land in that lane of, oh, my God, I'm not alone. Like, we could literally put people like Dr. Frank out of business if we would just talk to each other. (laughs) Yeah, I'd be fine with it. I'll figure out something else to do. Right, right. (laughs) So I mean, um, I am a hairstylist, so I do feel like I should get paid a lot more like you, Frank, to be honest. (laughs) So, I mean, I do feel like a psychologist sometimes. Yeah, I'll bet you. Oh, yeah. Hairstylists and bartenders, absolutely. Uh, The the clientele is slightly different, but yeah, the, the job is actually the same. Well, let's uh, let's start to, to wind down. What's what's been the lesson for you in all of this? That life is worth living. I wish I wouldn't have let it control me for 18 years. I mm. still was living, but I was not my true self. I am my absolute true self in life right now. Yeah. And a good husband and two great kids and a great Absolutely. career. And, and finally, finally, you have the life that maybe you dreamed about as a little girl. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really happy for you, Brandy. Thank you so much. Me too. Yeah. How are you feeling after this? Um, I want to get off the phone and scream at the top of my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do. Because it's been it's been too long. Um, like I said, I told you I would love to be a motivational speaker. I would mm. love to just share my story and and um I feel like this is a great first step in my next step in life and journey. You said it, Frank, enough for enough for a few lifetimes there. Um, the first time that I talked to Brandy and I do kind of, for, for those that don't know, I do a little pre-interview before we were going to jump on and record the series, right? And it just yeah. kind of get an idea for what, what's going on. I probably cried for about six minutes when I talked to Brandy because the overwhelming thing that I felt sadness about was how long she carried this thing. Right. And how long all the people in her life probably made comments, this, that, and the other thing to make her feel like she couldn't talk about it and she couldn't be open. And, and man, if you ask me, that's the stuff that's really hurting us, isn't it? That's stuff that we keep inside. Stuff usually lingers and affects us way longer than it has to. Uh, and usually we have to get to some just totally fed up point <laughs> before we decide to like do something about it, to, to take the next scary step, right. Of, of telling someone or doing something or asking for help or whatever that is, we waste a lot of time. And usually, <laughs> like you said, we said before, 99 times out of a hundred, it is not that bomb that we think it's going to be uh, that usually ends in, in a hug rather than an explosion. Well, and didn't you hear her? It's like the, the friend she was so terrified to talk to had oh, a yeah. polar opposite reaction. It's yeah. just, I don't know. You can't say that enough times if you ask me, right? Like I like yeah. to end the, every speech I give. I say this at the end. I say everything you think might happen might not. Like you really need to consider that everything you yeah. think might be a disaster might not. Right. Oh. Well, and there's the cliche too, right? Like, what is it? Those don't. What am you know? What I'm telling me out here? I, I think the saying is, "Those who matter don't mind, and those who mind don't matter." There you go. Thank you. Woo. And I'd never yeah. even heard that before, but that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And it's yeah. so true, right? Like, if you're holding on to that thing. And you tell somebody and all of a sudden they care a whole lot about it and it changes the way that they look at you or whatever. Maybe they never really mattered as much. We have three goals with Learn From People Who Lived It. One, to help you feel less alone. Two, encourage you to seek out a coach, a therapist, a church, anyone who can help you get through your journey and find some healing. Three, when you're ready, share your story with us. Hi, it's Tim. And Beth from the Mulhausen Group Real Estate. Thank you for listening to Learn From People Who Lived It.
You can find them online at tmgphoenix.com. Thank you so much for spending a little time with us. We're about to listen to the lead track off the new album from Blaine Long called Bacon. A quick reminder that ASI-AV.com, that's that audio-visual company I was telling you about. This woman-owned company has more than two decades of experience, and if you're on the IT staff and you've got your next build-out, please reach out to these folks. They work with schools, they work with corporations, they work with just about everybody, and they pay really close attention to that last 5%. Visit them online at ASI-AV.com. Okay, Blaine Long and Bacon off the new album, Royal. She bit my heart, she didn't break it. Well, she took a big bite, said it tastes like bacon. Lips like Presley, moves like Elvis. You forget about your heart when she shakes her pelvis. Hey. Oh, we got nights to dream and wings to fly. Still young, but not tonight. I wouldn't have it any other way. We got gravy boats and mortgage payments. It's been so long since I've seen the rain. It's where I'll be when I die. Where I'm be when I die. We got nights to dream and wings to fly. We're still young, but not tonight. I wouldn't have it any other way. 